the celebrated Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle said that when he had to do a biography of Oliver Cromwell, said that first of all, before I could write a single line, I first had to dig out the dead body of Oliver Cromwell from under a mountain of dead dogs. Cromwell, I think that when anyone uh, seeks to find the truth about the role and ideas of Lenin and Trotsky today is faced with a similar task. There is a heap of lies, of falsifications, of distortions for a reason, for a reason, the same reason that they poured calumnies and slanders on the memory of Oliver Cromwell and on the memory of Marat and Robespierre and the French Revolutionaries, exactly the same, only more so, in relation to the memory and the reality and the truth of these two great Russian revolutionaries, the two greatest Marxists of the 20th century. And that's not an accident. First of all, the Stalinist, the old Stalinist histories can be discounted as completely worthless. They present, on the one hand, Lenin as a kind of uh, saint. You know, when he died, they mummified his body and his widow protested, Krupskaya protested. She said, Vladimir Ilyich all his life was opposed to icons. Now they've turned him, when he's dead, they've turned him into an icon. Lenin for us is not an icon. He's a real, living, important revolutionary figure. And Trotsky, of course, if Lenin is a saint, then Trotsky, of course, was the devil incarnate. That uh, uh, rubbish can be completely dis discounted. But even worse rubbish was in preparation after the fall of the Soviet Union. And paradoxically, the authors of a lot of this uh, rubbish are ex-Stalinists from Russia. There's an industry, a very profitable industry, in producing a mountain of books. Uh, titles come out every year, every month practically, exposing and attacking and slandering the memory of Lenin and Trotsky. The latest lie is that Stalinism and Leninism are the same. By the way, that's the same line that the Stalinists used to peddle that somehow the monstrous, totalitarian, bureaucratic, repressive, murderous regime of the Stalinists was somehow a product of Bolshevism, a product of a kind of original sin of Bolshevism, of Leninism, allegedly the, the very idea, the organizational ideas in particular of democratic centrism, somehow were responsible for this criminal, gangster uh, Regime. Of course, the reason for this is not an accident. It flows from the fear of revolution on the part of the ruling class. The purpose of this falsification is to poison the minds of the young generation because they can see what's happening in Brazil, in Turkey, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Greece, one country after another. Revolution is coming back on the order of the day, and therefore it is necessary it is an imperative necessity from the standpoint of the ruling class that young people should uh, have, have it clear in their mind revolution is bad news. Revolutions end badly, therefore you better not uh, go down that road. That's the purpose of this stuff. Now we would say the, the opposite. If one takes the Russian Revolution of 1970 which somebody said in the course of today's uh, very good discussions, by the way, was the greatest single event in human history. If one takes that event and examines the event, the way in which this revolution took place, it is most extraordinary. I, I don't think in the entire history of political parties you will not find a single comparable example of what was a small group 
in February 1970, no more than 8,000 members in a country of 150 million people. I suppose it, 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 it proportionate to the size of population, they might have been even smaller than what we are. So that should give you some consolation. A tiny group, a tiny minority, the minority of a minority, within a space of nine months, was able to lead millions of workers, of soldiers, of peasants, to the seizure of power. And no matter what you might think about the Russian Revolution, you can say this, by the way, pass me another five minutes. Going up. Yes. Say this about it. That here, for the first time in history, if one excludes that glorious episode of the Paris, glorious but tragic episode of the Paris Commune, here for the first time, the working class actually overthrew, they succeeded in overthrowing the old regime and taking power into their own hands. And at least beginning, they have that merit, at least beginning the marvelous task of the socialist transformation of society. Now surely this is worthy of note. And if one, if one asks who's responsible for that, well, Trotsky himself made the point later on in the 1930s that in the last analysis, the success or failure of the Bolshevik Revolution in, in October 1917 was due, due to the presence of one man. I would say two. I believe Trotsky is being unduly modest. It was due to the presence of two men, of Lenin and Trotsky. Without the presence of Lenin and Trotsky, that revolution would never have taken place. Now, I am conscious of the fact that when I say this, mechanical Marxists, people who don't understand Marxism really, will immediately say, yes, but this is, a, this is an idealist position. Uh, history cannot be explained in terms of individuals, great men, great women, and surely that's anti-Marxist. Yes, of course. If it's put in that sense, it is. It would be anti-Marxist. And yet, you see, Marx and Engels never denied the, ro the role of the individual in history. On the contrary, there are certain moments in which the entire fate of a nation or of a class can indeed be determined by a small group of individuals or even one person. Yes, but isn't that the true of two any factory? There can be positions in a, in a factory which, on, which is on the verge of a strike, where one single intervention in a mass meeting can determine whether that strike is going to take place or not. So yes, the individual plays a gigantic role in history. Yes, but that does not mean to say that the individual can rise above great historical process is far from it. You see, on the one hand it's true that without the presence of Lenin and Trotsky the Bolshevik Revolution could never have succeeded in 1917. It is equally true that for a period of 20 years prior to that, Lenin and Trotsky were entirely, for most of the time at least, were isolated and completely powerless. They could do nothing to reverse the process of history. It's also due that after Lenin died, for reasons which we will explain tomorrow, Trotsky was, was impotent, couldn't uh, change the course of history. So, what are we left with? Well, let's put it this way. There are certain moments in history where there is a, a certain concatenation of forces in which the in intervention of even a small group can be decisive. Even one person can be decisive. That's a fact which is borne out by the, by the whole of, uh, of history. Now, I think that it would be a good thing to use a little bit of, of imagination. I don't think we do this sufficiently. Think for a moment of the situation that the Bolsheviks that Lenin had to face prior to 1917. What kind of a country was Tsarist uh, Russia? It was an extremely backward, semi-feudal country. The working class was a tiny minority. When I say that it was backward, well, how backward? Well, I, well, I'll tell you. Let's quantify it. In a country of 150 million people, you know how many industrial workers there were? 3.5 million. 
in, even on the broadest scale, including transport, mining, all, all other sectors of the working class, at no more than 10 million. Think about it. Think about it. No more than 10 million workers in a country of 150 million. This is infinitely more backward than what Pakistan is today. That's the, the, the reality of the state. Uh, and bearing in mind the previous discussion that we just had about the colonial revolution, it's true that Marx never envisaged a, a, revol a proletarian revolution in a country, a backward country like Russia. Never envisaged it. On the contrary. Marx predicted that the revolution would begin in France, would be continued in Germany, and be finished in England. Russia, Russia didn't enter into his calculations. The reason being that when Marx was writing that, the Russian working class virtually did not exist. And yet, of course, the whole situation was changed after Marx died. Couldn't analyze this phenomenon, it didn't exist. As a result of imperialism, as a result of the export of capital, you get the phenomenon which Trotsky and Lenin de uh, defined as the combined and un uh, uneven development. That is to say, with the export of capital to Tsarist Russia, you have this huge backward peasant country with a tiny working class, yes, but with the most modern machinery, the biggest big factories set up by foreign capital from France, Britain, America, Germany, Belgium, capital, big factories, in which the, the peasants who just come off the land were thrown into what Trotsky described as the seething cauldron of factory life. And precisely the export of capital, what it means is this. Russia did not have to go, the same goes for China and all other countries of the world. These countries did not have to pass through the same slow, organic uh, developments that, as for example England, which Marx analyzed was the classical country of capitalism. These are not classical countries of capitalism. The countries in which, in which the most backward peasant feudal, semi-feudal relationships are coupled with the most explosive development of the most modern machinery, technology, and so on. Yes, and with the import of modern, the most modern machinery, you also get the import of the most modern ideas, particularly Marxism. Now, I realize, of course, that... Uh, Nothing of what I'm going to say is fashionable. This avalanche of, of nonsense, of, of lies and distortions, these books which appear every year, they all present uh, the following vision. What they say is this. Ah, well, you see, there never was a revolution in Russia. There was no revolution in 1917. It was a coup. You heard of this? You heard of that? It was Le Lenin and the Bolsheviks organized a coup d'etat behind the backs of, of the masses. A tiny group of conspirators seized power in Russia in 97. You heard that argument? Now, whenever I hear that, I say, if, any if anyone president has got that position, I'll ask them a question. Please tell me how. Please give me the recipe where, where, whereby a tiny group of conspirators can seize power in Britain, and I will embrace it wholeheartedly. <laughs> let, let, me, let me into the secret, please. This is arrant nonsense. It does not even make sense, not even common sense, to argue, argue like that. On the contrary, the Russian Revolution of 1917 was the most democratic, the most popular uh, revolution with the maximum participation of the masses in the entire history of revolutions. Perhaps we'll deal with that argument a little bit more tomorrow. But you see, this is such a dramatic turnaround. That's why they try to mystify it. They can't even understand it themselves. How does it come about that such a small party acquires a mass influence? In order to answer that question, one would have to look at the entire history of Bolshevism. Regretfully, I don't have enough time to do that. There is a book called uh, Bolshevism, The Road to Revolution, written by a promising young author. <laughs> Uh, the same author that wrote uh, Lenin and Trotsky together with Ted Grant when he was 24 years of age. On the, on the table there. You could, I would advise you to read this uh, this material. But if I if I may if I may attempt at least to, to touch on on the high points, how did this party emerge? So here you have uh, an extremely backward country. And by the way, just imagine this: 
Not only was it an extremely backward country, it was a vicious, monstrous, oppressive police state. The most monstrous police state in Europe. The Tsar of Russia had at his disposal a vast army. Think of it. He had a huge police force. He had the Cossacks. He had a secret police, the Okhrana, which penetrated every nook and cranny of the opposition movement. There were no legal parties. There were no legal trade unions. So how is it possible? And I'll add, I'll add something else for your consideration. Tsarist Russia occupied the same position at that time as American imperialism today. It was the gendarme of uh, European reaction. Every single European revolution was crushed by the leaden rump of Tsarism. So how is it conceivable to have a, a proletarian revolution under conditions like that? In fact, I'm fairly sure that when Plekhanov and the early Russian Marxists attended international con con conferences of the Second International, I'm sure that perhaps people, people wouldn't have said anything very much because they'd be too polite. But secretly, they say these people are a bit crazy. Not quite right in there. How can you talk about uh, a, a revolution in Russia? It did not seem possible. It was possible. And it did happen. <coughs> Now, of course, the, the key to this is, is the thing which we've discussed so much today, we've mentioned so many times, the question of leadership. You can have, uh, look, how many times has it happened in the history of warfare? You've got a big army you know, composed of very valiant, very courageous soldiers that's been defeated by a far smaller army led with efficient officers and well-trained professional soldiers. That's happened many times. We need to organize. It's a tragedy when you look around the world, you see these colossal developments in Brazil, in Turkey. Wonderful, it's a wonderful potential. Here you've got the, all the courage that you, that you require, all the desire to change society. There's something missing. There's something missing which will, if it's not uh, put in place in time, these movements cannot succeed. They can never succeed by spontaneous combustion and overthrowing the existing tyranny. That factor, the Bolshevik party, was built in Russia over a period of about 20 years, going through all sorts of experiences. It's not, not time to deal with it. And it started with very humble beginnings. There were opposition groups, Marxist groups, developing all over Russia, but they were not centralized. It was Lenin that, 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 that commenced the work, the necessary work, of centralizing and organizing the party. Some people are a bit allergic to this. Uh, uh, even the words centralizing and organizing are an anathema to some of these young kids who imagine that you occupy a square and that's the end of it. It's not the end of it. It's not even the beginning of it. Centralization and organization are necessary. Of course, we, we refer to democratic centralism, full democratic freedoms and rights, not bureaucratic centralism. But believe you me, how is it even conceivable to pose the serious task of overthrowing a centralized bourgeois state armed to the teeth with disorganized groups acting on a spontaneous basis. It is a nonsense. It's an arrant nonsense of the most dangerous sort. Lenin began to organize the party, but of course uh, there's, there's all kinds of problems. You probably know that at the very first Congress, it, it really was the first Congress, it's known as the second Congress, that took place in 1903 in London, actually. It's the only place that they could meet legally. There was a split between the, the, what became the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. That's to say, between the revolutionary proletarian wing and the opportunist reformist wing. In this split, of course, but, it, but it was, it, this was not uh, definitive. It wasn't even clear. Even Lenin didn't know what the split was about. Really speaking, in that split, the, the, the political crises were not clear. For example, in all the political sessions, there was no political disagreement. The actual split occurred in what appeared to be secondary matters, particularly the composition of the editorial board, the paper Iskra, in which there was, uh, there was a division, there was a split. Really speaking, the reason for that split, without expanding on it,
It was an anticipation of future developments. It wasn't definitive. Trotsky, for example, was very confused about that. He didn't understand what he was about. Initially, he sided with Martov, but he broke with Martov only a few months after the Congress. When it became clear that there were political questions, serious political questions were, were involved, it was a split between the hards and the softs, as well as what they called it. And what it showed is that, is that, 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 that every, every party, you see, a political party is a living organism. It goes through stages, the same as all of us go through stages, through stages from being a baby, learning how to crawl, uh, youth, adolescence, adulthood, and so on. You go through certain stages. And you must overcome. You, you can't remain on, on the initial stage. In the first embryonic stage of any party, it's like a small circle. It's disorganized. There's a lot of personal questions. It's informal. Informality is sufficient. You don't have to resort to votes or anything like that. You just agree a consensus and so on. Those methods are permissible, perhaps inevitable, in the initial stages. But once you get beyond a certain stage, as they had by 1903, those methods are entirely unacceptable and must be rejected. If you don't do that, then you will never develop. That, that was the real nature, reason for the split. I haven't got time to develop it. But by 1905, of course, a split is a damaging effect. We know. We've been through splits. We know a split always has a damaging effect. It weakened both the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. They were reduced to a tiny handful. So when the first Russian Revolution broke out in January 1905, the Marxists were, were really not in the running. They were, they were out of it. They had no influence among the working class. The workers looked upon them with suspicion. The workers actually were, were not members of the Bolsheviks or the Mensheviks. They were members of an organization run by a priest, Father Gapon, who also, also happened to be a police agent. And of course, uh, you had the, 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 the organized a peaceful demonstration on the 9th of uh, January 1905. Now, I want you to consider this because I often hear the argument put forward, ah, but there's a low level of consciousness. People mourn, you know, so-called Marxists mourn about the alleged low level of consciousness <coughs> of the working class. Yes, what was the level of the consciousness of the Russian workers in January 1907? I'll tell you, the average Russian worker at that time was recently come from the, the village. The village, Many of them were illiterate. They couldn't read or write. They were religious. They believed in God. And they believed in another spirit out of a bottle. Vodka. They would be, drink, drink vodka. They would beat their wives and so on. You know, politically, if anything, they'd be monarchists. They'd have illusions in the Tsar. That was your average Russian worker in January 1970. So that when the Bolsheviks, for example, and the Mensheviks offered to give them assistance during a strike, according to the reports I've read, the workers accepted the money reluctantly. And when, when the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks produced leaflets calling for a republic, the workers tore up the leaflets and sometimes beat them, beat them up. That was the level of consciousness. Until the 9th of January, when this priest organized a what was supposed to be a peaceful demonstration. Just imagine this. The Russian working class appears on the stage of history for the first time. In their hands is not red flags. Red flags were prohibited. No red flags, no revolutionary slogans, no down with the Tsar. They carried images of the Virgin Mary, icons, and they sang religious hymns. The Marxists, the social democrats, were ordered to the back when they asked to participate in the demonstration. They said, okay, yes, at the back. Go to, go to the back. And no banners, no red flags. That saved their life. <clears throat> saved their lives. Because uh, there was a clash. That the, the Cossacks and the, the army opened fire. And they killed, don't know how many people, at least a thousand. Men, women, children, old people, shot down. In the snow. The same evening, that very same evening, the same workers, because there's no other workers, there's only the workers that exist, the same workers who uh, tore up the leaflets and so on, went to the Bolsheviks with one demand, give us guns, give us arms, we don't have a Tsar anymore. 
That is how quickly consciousness can change and always does change in a revolutionary situation. And under those circumstances, the party took off. Incidentally, they fused again, they, they, they reunited the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, so that there wasn't a clear cut split, as I've said uh, earlier. I've got no time to deal with the revolution except to say that Trotsky, only 26 years of age, who by the way was more in touch with the workers than the Bolsheviks, if the truth were to be told, became, was elected the first president of the uh, Petersburg Soviet, played a colossal role in the revolution. 26 years of age, just imagine that. Of course, the revolution was ultimately crushed, it was ultimately defeated. You could say it was premature, if you like, and yet, you see, that was a school, it was a dress rehearsal. And the workers remembered those lessons, particularly the lessons of the Soviet, which, of course, is a Soviet in Russian just means a council, a workers' council. It's like an extended strike committee, let's put it, put it that way. It spontaneously was thrown up by the workers. You see that Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky didn't invent the Soviets. That was the creativity of the working class, of our class. The workers themselves that developed these things, these organisms, these marvelous organs of struggle. But it ultimately was crushed and you had a period of reaction, black reactions. You sometimes come complain how difficult things are or the problems that Come as you have no conception what difficulties mean. You've got no idea. After the crushing of the uh, 1905 revolution, hundreds of thousands of workers were imprisoned, tortured, shot, hanged by punitive exhibitions. The peasants also with punitive uh, attacks by, by the army. And many young comrades, like yourselves, committed suicide. <coughs> They took that because they thought it's all finished, it's all over, there's no more, we, we've lost. They were wrong. Within a few years, there was another outburst of revolutionary activity from 1912 to 1914. Barakirs again appeared in, in, in St. Petersburg. The Russian working class was on the move. And this time, you see how, the, how, how time changes people. This time, the Bolsheviks, who formed themselves for the first time as a party, in 1912, not 1903, 1912, the Bolsheviks were, were, represented the big majority, about two-thirds of the organized workers were, were Bolsheviks. And therefore it seemed as if the, the, the situation was in good hands, was moving again towards the revolution, before it was a, a black period, a very black period. In fact, Lenin was always a very uh, optimistic man. Lenin was always optimistic, never complained. <coughs> But his, his wife recalled that in, two, in 1908, when, it, when for, the, for the third time he had to go into uh, exile, or the second time that he went into exile, they arrived in Zurich on a, on a cold, miserable, rainy morning, and Lenin turned to his wife and said, you know, I have a feeling that I've come here to be buried. That was Lenin in 1908. So just imagine the situation that existed. But within a couple of years, the move, within four years, the workers were on the move again. But that movement was cut across by the World, world War I, the First World War, cut right across that. The workers were conscripted into the army where they were buried in a sea of peasants, back with peasants. Lenin again was isolated again. For the third time he had to go into exile. And Lenin at that time was completely and absolutely isolated. In those days, you might find it hard to believe. You know something, comrades? There was no Facebook. <laughs> you know, can you imagine it? And no mobile phones, and no internet. How on earth could people manage? And the whole of Europe was, was, was in, in a, this dance of death, this dance macabre of war. Workers of all countries unite. The workers of all countries were slaughtering each other in the interest of different imperialist groups. The so-called socialist leaders had all betrayed, with the exception of the Russians and the Serbs. Imagine, what a catastrophe. And Lenin was in contact with a tiny group. Lost all contacts with the identity. Such that, in January 1917, Lenin was giving a speech to a, a school of young socialists in, uh, in Switzerland, like this. And he said the following, you know, he said, I'm, I'm an old man. It wasn't really true, he was younger than me, but still he said it anyway. He said, I'm an old man, 
And uh, I probably will never live to see the socialist revolution. Depends on you, the new generation and so on. This is in January 1917. Within weeks, the Russian workers had overthrown the Tsar, set up Soviets, and Russia again was on, on the revolutionary road. You see how situations uh, can, can change uh, <coughs> quickly. Lenin understood the position. Now, you see, I haven't got time to deal with, with, with the politics of this, but you can ask, well, what was it that prevented Trotsky from joining the Bolshevik and the Bolsheviks in the previous period? On the political questions, there wasn't really much of a difference. A very small difference. Trotsky and Lenin were entirely in agreement against the Mensheviks, who were the opportunist, the reformist group. Uh, there was a, a slight difference of, 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 of in, in, the, in the sense that Lenin had the position Whereas the, whereas the Menshevik said, look, the workers must not take power. Because Russia is a backward country, there aren't the material conditions for sources, and perfectly true, by the way. In, in Russia, if you take it in isolation, there were not uh, conditions for sources. And therefore, the workers must collaborate with, support the liberals, support the liberal, fight for democracy. No question of the workers taking power. Lenin said no. He said, the Russian liberals are uh, treacherous, they will betray, they're egotistic, they're weak, they will support the counter-revolution. And therefore, Lenin said, the only real revolutionary forces in Russian society are two, the workers and the poor peasants. And they must take, uh, take power and form what he termed the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasant. He still didn't, didn't speak of socialism exactly, but he was uh, more or less on the right lines. Trotsky went further. Trotsky was the only one with his theory of permanent revolution, a brilliant theory, which he worked out again when he was 26 years of age in 1905. The theory of the permanent revolution. Trotsky was the only one that stated as early as 1905, the Russian proletariat can come to power before the German proletariat, before the English and the French, because of the, of the extreme conditions in Russian society. So, the question of taking power is going to be posed. The peasantry cannot take power, although the peasantry is an auxiliary, of course, a necessary auxiliary, an ally. But it must be the proletariat that takes power. Lenin didn't express himself with such clarity. But in 1917, both men were in complete agreement, unlike other leaders of the Bolshevik party, such as Stalin, Kamenev, particularly those, and Zinoviev, who, really speaking, were putting forward the Menshevik position. No, they, they were afraid, in effect. That's what it boils down to. They were afraid. No, the Russian workers must not take power. We cannot take power. It's adventurism. It's Trotskyism, even some of them say. Lenin, when he came back from uh, abroad, from Switzerland, had to wage a struggle against uh, the, the party leaders. He went so far, this man who defends democratic centralism, <coughs> went so far as to say to the Central Committee, he threatened to appeal to the workers in, in Petrograd over the heads of the Central Committee on this question. All power to the Soviets, the workers must take power. Down with the provisional government. He believed that that was his position. No trust anyway, no trust in the provisional government, to be more accurate. Distrust Kerensky particularly, he said. And all power to the Soviets. By the way, what does that mean? Many people uh, know the expression, all power to the Soviets, but not many people know what it means. You know, as Hegel said, was bekannt ist, ist der home noch nicht erkannt. What is known is not necessarily thereby understood. You don't know what it means. You see, at that time when Lenin put that slogan forward, the Bolsheviks did not control the Soviets. They were controlled, if you like, by the Russian Ed Milibans. <laughs> they were controlled by the reformists. The reformist leaders. And therefore, what Lenin was saying to the workers of the Soviet was this, look, we Bolsheviks stand for socialism and socialist revolution, okay? Nevertheless, you, you don't uh, agree. It's too advanced. You think that we're being too impatient. Okay. Well, why not agree on, on, on some other things? Peace, bread, and land. And in order to get that, the Soviets must take power. The leaders, they, they said to the Russian Ed Miliband, look, you take power. You take power. Lenin actually said, if you take power, there'll be no civil war, no bloodshed. We'll have a peaceful revolution. He said this many times. You know, some of the sexual, always in favor of buckets of blood. 
Unless you have big buckets of blood, then you're not a genuine revolutionary. You know? Not so. Then it said a, a hundred times, no, we, we Bolsheviks, we stand for a peaceful revolution. We don't want a civil war. We don't want bloodshed. You take the power and there will be no bloodshed. But of course, the reformists were not prepared to take power. They were clinging to their, uh, to their uh, uh, alliance with the bourgeoisie. <coughs> Lenin put forth the slogan, not, not down with the provisional government, actually. Down with the ten capitalist ministers. That's what he said. Down with the ten capitalist ministers. Let the reformists take power. You take power. You're the majority. Take power. Of course, they didn't want to do this. Now, I haven't got time to deal with the, the whole situation in 1917. The best thing you can read on that is Trotsky's marvelous history of the Russian Revolution. <clears throat> Suffice it to say that Lenin won the struggle against the opportunists. Trotsky joined, had no difference and joined with Lenin's full support and was immediately put into the top leadership of the party with the highest vote, by the way. People recognized that Trotsky was uh, one of us. He was a Bolshevik, in effect. And from that time, as, as Lenin said, he said this in 1918, from that time he said there's been no better Bolshevik than Trotsky. That's Lenin uh, speaking. The Russian Revolution of 1917, I mean, people like Orlando Figgs, you know? Who's from Cambridgeshire? Ah, you admit it, I see. <laughs> yes, Orlando, you heard of Orlando Figgs? What a bastard. <laughs> you know, no, not you, I mean, not you, I mean, I'm not <laughs> He wrote a, a, a great big book like this. I, for my sins, I read this book, you know. I read it all. I swallowed the whole damn thing. It's full of, full of the usual slander. But even Figs, he accidentally blurted out the truth when he said that in, in, in October, it was more like a police operation. He said, that's more or less correct. They just arrested the members of the old boss with their the old government. They had the complete support of the working class. That's the reason. The Russian Revolution, at least in, in, in Petrograd, was a bloodless affair. It's as near to a peaceful revolution as what you could imagine. Where you had an absolute bloodbath was after that, during the Civil War, when the, Soviet, the young Soviet Republic was invaded by 21 foreign armies of intervention. The British, the French, the Romanians, the Czechs, the Poles, the Japanese, you, you name it. 21 armies of foreign intervention. And they had no army. Now all this campaign, oh yes, they blood, they're dripping with blood. Look, Stalin was violent and Stalin used violence and Stalin had the checker. But Lenin and Trotsky also were violent. They also killed people. Look what terrible people. It's the same. Is it the same? You see, I think, comrades, we have to distinguish between revolutionary violence and self-defense and counter-revolutionary violence. Is there no difference? I think there is. I believe that there is. Let me put it this way. And by the way, they had no army. It was Trotsky that built up the Red Army from nothing. Lenin said in a conversation with Gorky, Maxim Gorky, the writer, he, he banged the table, according to Gorky, Lenin banged the table with his fist and said, referring to Trotsky, show me another man that could, could build an army like that from nothing. And the, based uh, partly on the, on the heroism of the Red Army and Trotsky's leading role, but partly also because the Bolsheviks waged a revolutionary war, a new type of war, appealing to the soldiers of the uh, enemy camp in, in, in leaflets in their own language. Why have you come to Murmansk? You see the leaflets in English. Lloyd George, by the way, there was mutinies in every single one of the armies. There were mutinies here in Britain, in London. The leaders of the Dock Workers Union, Ernest Bevan, who later became a right winger, came to number 10 Downing Street in 1920 and threatened Lloyd George with civil war if they were going to help the reactionary Poles against Russia. They were mutinies in all the armies. As a matter of fact, there was an incident. The uh, uh, Prime Minister of Britain at that time was Lloyd George, who Lenin uh, admired and told the communists to him that he was Welsh and therefore very intelligent. <laughs> And uh, Lloyd George, when he withdrew the two from, from the north of Russia, from Murmansk, there was a big scandal in the House of Parliament. The Tories started to attack him. So he stood up and said, gentlemen, I was compelled to withdraw our forces from Murmansk because they were infected with Bolshevik influenza. There was a flu epidemic taking place at, at that time. 
the Bolsheviks had an effect within them, and therefore they, they, they succeeded in, in defeating the revolution. They, they, they succeeded in the civil war. Yes, but what was left afterwards? In 1921, what was left? Uh, a, a ruined country, starving. In one year alone, 1926 million people starved to death in Russia. You, you can't, listen, you can't build socialism, we'll look at this tomorrow. But socialism must have a material base. You can't build socialism on the basis of, of starvation. And that is the, expl the, the explanation for the bureaucracy, the rise of the bureaucracy, the rise of Stalin, is, is because of the material conditions. We'll deal with this tomorrow. Now, to the end of his life, uh, Lenin was very concerned about this, very desperately worried. Let's, let's be clear about this. The Russian Revolution was thoroughly democratic, based on, on workers' control, Soviets, limitation of official uh, salaries, and, uh, and the arming of the working class, and so on and so forth. But gradually, uh, particularly after the Civil War, when the immediate danger was, uh, was, was removed, you, here's a vast country of 150 million people with a shattered, in, a shattered industry, shattered uh, railways, people threatened with starvation. And therefore, you had the rise of the bureaucracy, these millions of, of Tsarist uh, officials who suddenly realized, ah, we are important. They hid under the bed during the uh, revolution. But now they became managers, directors, they joined the party, became communists, in inverted commas. And of course, they were interested in their uh, living standards, their careers, and so on and so forth. The slogan, socialism in one country, which Stalin put forward, reflected their interests. These were not genuine communists. They were not interested in the storm and stress of revolution and international revolution. Because Lenin understood, and Trotsky understood, all the Bolsheviks understood, that the fate of the Russian revolution depended on spreading the revolution to Europe. Lenin said a hundred times. He even said that he was prepared to sacrifice the Russian revolution for the sake of the German revolution. But once the, these revolutions in Germany, Hungary, and so on were defeated, for reasons we explained this morning, Russia, Soviet Russia, was isolated under conditions of terrible material backwardness. That's the reason for the rise of the bureaucracy. We'll deal with that tomorrow. Lenin died in 1924. That undoubtedly speeded up the process of bureaucratic degeneration. And a small minority, led by Trotsky, organized the, the left opposition in an attempt to defend the ideas of workers' democracy, of proletarian, the ideas of Lenin. The other side, led by Zinoviev, actually, not Stalin, it was Zinoviev that started this business, invented the, the legend of Trotskyism. This is Trotsky. It wasn't Trotskyism at all. It was Leninism that they were trying to defend against the Stalinist bureaucracy. Now, as you know, uh, Trotsky was defeated by Stalin. And some people say, well, look, uh, Stalin must have been better than Trotsky, or he's cleverer than Trotsky. Trotsky was naive. Listen, uh, Trotsky was a bit naive, couldn't organize a faction fight, and he was outmaneuvered by Stalin. Stalin was more realistic. Stalin was more far-sighted. On the contrary, Stalin understood precisely nothing, foresaw nothing, prepared nothing. Trotsky's position, the position of the left opposition, was shown to be correct. But that's not the point. You see, the question is this. If an idea is put forward, Ted put this, explained this many times, if an idea like socialism in one country is put forward and, and achieves mass support, okay, that idea must reflect the interest, the material interest of a class or a subclass within society. Socialism in one country reflected the interest of the bureaucracy, which became increasingly more confident, arrogant, aggressive, and so on. Whereas the working class in Russia, small working class, tired, exhausted, imagine, after many years of war, revolution, civil war, hunger, starvation, many of the best elements were killed in the civil war anyway. The rest were tired, exhausted, <coughs> depressed. Of course, Given that class balance of forces, there was no way that uh, Trotsky could have succeeded. And he knew that. You know. Trotsky knew that he couldn't succeed. He knew that he would be defeated. And there were no illusions that he would be defeated, for the reasons which I've stated. So why did he bother? 
Trotsky was fighting not for power. He knew that that was impossible. He was fighting to preserve the, the genuine ideas of the Russian Revolution, of Lenin, of Bolshevism, against stuff for the new generation, for the future. That's what he was doing. Which he succeeded. It's only thanks to, to, to Trotsky and his uh, struggle that he succeeded in th that we are here today, put it that way. Now, subsequently, I have to deal with what happened after that. As you know, Trotsky was expelled from the Communist Party in 1927, was exiled first of all to, to uh, Turkey and then forced to move from one country, from one country to no country would admit it, including the so-called democracies. You know, plan the planet without a visa, somebody once said. That's about it. Just put yourself in Trotsky's position. One man against the entire world. He ended up in, in Mexico. And during this period, he had to see the, the murder of all his friends, his colleagues, his comrades, his family, his children. They were killed, one by, were murdered by Stalin, one, one after the other. His uh, younger son, Leon Sedov, was murdered in Paris when he was recovering from an operation. His younger son was particularly tragic because he wasn't political. That's why they thought he would be safe. But Stalin had a policy, you know. He issued an order for the arrest of all children and relatives of all oppositionists. They were all arrested, even young kids. <coughs> were arrested, sent to concentration camps, disappeared, killed, and so on and so forth. Le uh, uh, Sergei was... Uh, arrested, which was a heavy blow for Trotsky and his wife. In fact, Trotsky, was, like Lenin, was a very optimistic person, but he actually wrote in his diary. He contemplated suicide. He said, well, what should I do? Should I kill myself? Maybe if I kill myself, Stalin will, will, will let, our, let our son go. There was no question of that. He knew that. Trotsky knew that. He knew that his son was dead. His son refused to sign any statement against his father after torture and so on that he was uh, shot, I think in 1937. Same year, I think it was 1937. The Trotskyists in Russia, you, you know, the Trotskyists, really speaking, were the most persecuted movement in history. Probably the most persecuted movement in history. The Trotskyists were sent to a concentration camp in Vortu, a notorious camp in the Arctic Circle called Vortu. Vorkuta. Even in these hell holes, these Stalinist hell holes, the, Stalinist, the, the, the Trotskyists maintained their discipline, held party meetings, discussed world affairs, tried to find out what was happening, maintained protests, strikes, hunger strikes, they even succeeded in getting their demands through against the camp administration, whereupon an instruction was sent from Moscow, from Stalin personally. And uh, one day in 1937, the Trotskyists in Vorkuta were taken out into the tundra, into the frozen wasteland, in groups of ten, men, women, and children over the age of 14, and shot. And as they were taken out to their deaths, they sang the Internationale. Many people died like that, with the words, long live Comrade Trotsky. You see, this is this is our real heritage, comrades. You mustn't forget this. This is where we come from. Just imagine the position of Trotsky under these circumstances, maintaining this struggle, writing the most incredible books like *The Revolution Betrayed*, *In Defense of Marxism*, and so on. It's astonishing to think how he could maintain his morale under these, these circumstances. And he knew that he was condemned to death. Stalin issued an instruction for his assassination in 1937 was very displeased when it wasn't carried out, then ordered a new guy, Suda Platov, to organize an assassination, and of course you know what, what occurred. May 1940, there was a raid on Trotsky's house in Coyoacan, in Mexico City, organized by this gangster, this uh, painter, David Sequeiros, Stalinist fanatic. I've spoken to Trotsky's grandson many times because he was uh, a victim of this attack. They came in the middle of the night, the door was opened by somebody who was an agent working on the inside. 
they burst in and sprayed the whole premises with, uh, with machine gun bullets and threw in incendiary bombs. It's a miracle. How anyone was not killed, it's, 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 it's a miracle. Uh, Stefan Volkov's theory, what he tells me, is he thinks that, th that these guys were afraid to see the faces of their victims, and therefore they didn't put the light on. Simple as that. They didn't put the light on. They sprayed them the, the, in, indiscriminately. The only person that was hit, actually, was uh, Sheva Volkov, was uh, Stefan Volkov, my friend, my old friend, <coughs> was shot in the foot. Some of them survived. The first attempt. After that, measures were taken by the Trotskyists to, in America to build the fortifications. Trotsky was skeptical about this. He says, look, the second attack will not be like the first. <clears throat> will not be a repetition. He was right, of course. 20th of August, uh, somebody was posing as a sympathizer, came in to the premises, entered Trotsky's room, allegedly he was supposed to be presenting an article for Trotsky to read, and while Trotsky was reading this at his desk, he pulled out of his uh, raincoat an ice pick and drove it down on Trotsky's skull. And even despite this, Trotsky still fought. He was not, uh, just imagine, he was struck on the head, bleeding, wounded. He had the strength to call out. He struggled with uh, the assailant. He was so shaken he didn't even have the guts to use his gun. He had a revolver. He didn't, didn't have the moral fiber to use it. The, the guards came in. But Trotsky was already dying. Dying. Uh, his last words, according to Hansen, the American Trotsky, the last thing he ever said was as follows. I am certain of the victory of the Fourth International. Go forward. Now you see, we have to understand where we've come from and the sacrifice, the enormous sacrifice made by people who have given the ultimate sacrifice. What we're asking from uh, you, yourselves is not nothing like that. But I just want to finish on one note, and it's this. You see, from what I've just stated, how easy it is to kill a human being. What fragile creatures we are. Any one of us could die at any time, whether of old age or disease or, or assassination or an accident. It doesn't take much skill to liquidate a human being. What you can never do, and what Stalin didn't succeed in doing, is this. You can never kill an idea whose time has come. And the ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, we would add Ted Grant, those ideas, have, they, they, their time has come. You're only going to look at the present world situation, it's an inspiration. And therefore we have no time to mourn the victims and martyrs of the past. We have work to do. We have important work to do. This is the anniversary of Ted Grant, I will deal with that tomorrow, but... Uh, the, the best way that we could celebrate the life and the works and the ideas of Trotsky and of Ted Grant is to build a Marxist organization, to build on the, first of all, to understand the ideas, to absorb the ideas of Marxism, secondly, to fight to put those ideas into practice. Because these are the only ideas that can transform the world and build a new, higher civilization, civilization on the basis of socialism.